right. Uh, next, so we're pardon? thrilled to have Professor Nima Arkani Hamid from Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton. Professor Arkani Hamid is the leading theoretical physicist of his generation who is concerned with the relation between theoretical and experimental particle physics. He received his PhD from Berkeley in 1997. Then, after a postdoc at Stanford, he returned to Berkeley as an assistant and a year later an associate professor. Then a year later, he went to Harvard as a full professor. And finally, to the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton, where he is now. Professor Nimar Pranihamid has taken a lead in proposing new physical theories that can be tested at the Large Hadron Collider at CERN and at future colliders. He proposed many original approaches to outstanding problems in particle physics. These include the proposal of large extra dimensions, new theories for the Higgs boson, new Nobel realizations of supersymmetries, and theories for dark matter. Uh, recently, he has also been a leading advocate for the development of the next generation of high-energy collider in China. Professor Arkani Hamid has won uh, numerous awards, including Packard and Sloan Fellowship, the Grip of Medal of European Physical Society, and a $3 million Fundamental Physics Prize in 2012. He is also featured prominently in 2013 documentary film, Particle Fever, about the search for the Higgs boson. And finally, uh, Nima has been an inspiration and an academic hero for a generation of uh, young physicists, and especially those who can make his 3M office hours. So here's a uh, <laughs> to be here at Brown, as uh, always. Um, I have many uh, wonderful friends here, and it's always uh, uh, terrific to visit. Um, uh, I have an absolutely ridiculous title, of course, um, um, and obviously I'm not really going to tell you about what we're going to know about quantum mechanics and space time in the uh, 23rd century. Actually, I, I have been giving a, a, a number of talks um, in the past few years on, uh, which I already thought was fairly audacious, on quantum mechanics and space time in the 21st century. Uh, but I decided, heck, we might as well just go, <laughs> go, go all out. Um, but, um, and, and, I mean, obviously the, uh, the biggest difficulty of, a, uh, uh, of any sort of talk like this is so beautifully and eloquently uh, uh, explained by Freeman towards the end of his talk is that science is unpredictable. And we don't know uh, what the, 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 the really uh, big surprising breakthroughs are going to be by definition. Uh, this is a, a little more exacerbated now in fundamental physics because this decade, right now, we're in, the, we're in the middle of a period where experiments are going to start giving us some verdict on sets of ideas that have been explored for, for decades. Uh, we're going to know whether some things are right or wrong one way or the other, and it feels like it's a sort of a bifurcatory moment in what the development of the subject might look like after that. And I can't really make guesses about what we're going to learn um, from the uh, experiment. Um, so, uh, so I, I don't want to make random guesses and uh, tell you what the consequences would be, like in a choose-your-own-adventure sort of story, you know, one thing after another. Um, but the reason I was excited to give this talk is that, uh, from another point of view, it also feels like we're at uh, a special moment in the history of the development of our subject, certainly uh, from the point of view of a theoretical physicist, a sort of moment that many of us feel doesn't come along you know, every few decades, but maybe comes along on the sort of century time scale, where the next set of questions that are in front of us, you know, you always have to work on the biggest questions you possibly can, but it's important to, to choose the next question, not the thing that's off to the mists of the far, far future. But the next biggest questions on the table right now involve really huge things. Uh, uh, I'll talk about it in the, in the talk, but uh, the, 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 there's a sense, I think, amongst uh, many people that we may be in a period a little bit akin to the period people found themselves somewhere between 1910 and 1925, when they knew there was a quantum revolution coming, 
They knew there was something wrong with classical physics. They knew something had to replace it. They didn't quite know what. And uh, they're in a period when they're struggling to find what it is. Many of us feel we're in a similar kind of place intellectually. It's not obvious it's going to take 15 years. It might take 150 or 250. Um, but uh, what I want to do is, is tell you what some of those threads are. Uh, what some of the things are that, that suggest that there is a radical new picture of, uh, of uh, fundamental physics of reality waiting for us. Um, but instead of just speculating about what it might be, what I want to do in order to give it a little bit more teeth is try so much as possible, and I'll make wilder and wilder speculations as we go on in the talk, but try so much as possible to connect it to something we can see concretely now. Uh, things that we can barely articulate sharply enough that we can start doing something about it now. And how long it'll take to develop and precisely what direction it'll develop from there may not be so obvious, but I want you to see that it's actually possible to do something about these uh, grand questions. Uh, and um, uh, of course, experiment is going to play a huge role uh, in this endeavor, and I'll, and I'll start the first part of the talk talking about what the sort of uh, 30, 40, 50 year frontiers are for experiment. Um, but most of the rest of the talk is going to be about more conceptual theoretical questions uh, and things where uh, it's possible for us to have some gauge about whether we're making progress or not um, uh, because of the tremendous amount of progress that we've made already. Um, so I actually I just want to start putting that start putting this in some context. That um, can, can can you guys see that? Is this just too small to see? Not really. Oh, okay. Uh, is it possible to make it bigger? We can try, but you had a 4.3 on a 16.9 in your power from your uh, okay. PDF. Let me see. Well, I mean, maybe maybe we can scroll down a little. No, I'm going to see if I can change your aspect ratio. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll start I'll start telling you anyway. So the um, uh, the main uh, the main if you wanted to summarize what we learned in the uh, 20th century, we started with these two big revolutions of relativity and quantum mechanics. And the main thing that we learned is that these two principles together are shockingly constraining uh, as to what the world can look like. If we only knew about one or the other, we could imagine in our theorist mind zillions of possible universes. Uh, but both of them together <coughs> tremendously constrain what the sufficiently long distance uh, universe can look like. By this I mean that if you're at a hand sufficiently competent theoretical physicists, just the broad framework of the laws of relativity and quantum mechanics, lock them up in a room, uh, refuse to let them look outside to see what the world actually looks like. Of course, it's all very counterfactual because there was a room that was in the world and so on, but never mind. <laughs> uh, that they would be able to, of course, from those two big principles that were ultimately derived from experiment, but starting from those principles, essentially with pure logic, they could then figure out the broad outlines of what the world could possibly look like at long distances. This is a stunning fact. It's not, and I, as I said, it's not true if you only knew one or, or, or the other. <coughs> this is tremendous straitjacket of having laws that are consistent with both of them. Uh, and that's this intellectual framework known as quantum field theory. Uh, uh, you can summarize this by saying the sufficiently competent theoretical physicists would come out of the room and say, look, whatever the ultimate laws of nature are, we don't know what they are, but if, as long as they're compatible with relativity and quantum mechanics, at long enough distances, we should see elementary particles that dominantly interact in little trees and threes coming together. A, you concatenate those interactions all possible ways to make all possible things in the world happen. And B, uh, the only possible elementary particles you can have have to be drawn out of this minuscule list. They can uh, be particles that have spin zero, one half, one, three halves, and two. Uh, then they would tell you that spin two guy is very special. You can only have one of them. And it does really strange things. It makes things move around in orbits around each other. It's gravity, right? They, they, they never knew about gravity. This is one of the, the uh, it's the, one of the consistent possibilities. In fact, in this case, it's unique. Then as you come down and spin, it gets a little less unique. You can have a bunch of spin one particles. There are things in our world that are photons and gluons. They have to have very special kinds of interactions. You can have spin a house particles like electrons and quarks. They would allow, as the possibility, spin zero particles. We had never seen an elementary spin zero particle before. Uh, that was something nature could do, compatible with the broad principles we hadn't seen it do. Finally, we saw it do it. That's uh, with the discovery of the Higgs particle on July 4th, uh, 2012. So 
So that's uh, that's that's a check. That's something which uh, uh, where, where 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 the world did more of what it was allowed to do compatible with these basic principles. And in fact, there's only one thing left that the world can do at long distances that we have not yet seen it do, which is to exploit the possibility of having a particle spin three ads. Uh, it turns out that if such a particle exists, uh, nature has to have a much larger symmetry, a symmetry of space-time, a bigger symmetry of space-time than, uh, than Einstein's, a sort of more quantum symmetry of space-time, and that's associated with the idea of supersymmetry that we have been hunting for uh, many, many years now. But this is all just a consequence of the consistency of relativity and quantum mechanics. And that's why we're in a tremendous straitjacket, because we still have lots of mysteries uh, we want to solve. But we can't just monkey around randomly. We monkey around randomly. We're not ruled out by new experiments. We're ruled out by all the old experiments that have happened for centuries already that gave us these two big principles uh, already. So 99.999% so of your life as a theoretical physicist is spent killing your own ideas, because almost none of them work. Uh, and, and none of them work uh, because they, they run afoul of some of these uh, basic principles. Alright, so uh, here's an outline of the rest of the talk. Uh, I first want to give you a, just a brief review of what some of the experimental frontiers are, and A, because I'm not an experimentalist, and B, because it's uh, hard to predict what uh, incredible technologies uh, might, might come down the line. This is not going to go as far as 250 years, but I'll restrict myself to what we sort of see coming in the next generation. Uh, then I want to uh, just set the stage with what some of the central, conceptual, theoretical dramas are of the uh, 21st century. And they have to do with the fact that these two big principles, relativity and quantum mechanics, uh, we have, uh, or space-time and quantum mechanics, a picture of space-time and quantum mechanics, we have reason to suspect that one or perhaps both of them uh, can't be fundamental, have to be replaced by something deeper in the next description of reality. Um, so, so one set of questions has to do with the deeper order of space-time and quantum mechanics. There's an equally burning set of questions that may well be related to the first time that has to do with the asking an extremely simple question, why is the world big? That's one of the most salient facts about the world. We have a large macroscopic universe. You would think we'd do all these other fancy, fantastic things. You would think we'd have a wonderful answer to such a simple question as why is the universe big? We have a crappy answer. Uh, to the question, why is the universe big? We have such an absurd answer to it that almost no one believes it. And uh, the essential difficulty is that we understand that, that there are quantum mechanical fluctuations uh, in the vacuum, particles and antiparticles popping out more and more violently as we go to shorter and shorter distances. And that makes it very hard to understand why if there's so much violent quantum mechanical stuff going on at very short scales, uh, why there's any macroscopic order in the universe at all. So the irony is that if you took these guys, uh, uh, these guys and gals, and you put them in the room, and you said, I'm telling you there's this big universe with relativity and quantum mechanics, go. What would it look like? They would come back, and they would give you everything that looks great. But then they would stare at things and say, wait a minute. It makes no sense that there's a big universe to begin with. That's completely insane. And they would not have a good uh, explanation for it. For reasons of time, and also because uh, um, uh, we're, the, there's a number of different issues involved in the uh, second one. Um, uh, I won't talk so much about the second one. I'll be happy to uh, chat about it with anyone who's in interested in afterwards. Uh, but I'll focus more on uh, the first one. And so that'll be a, that'll be a sort of recap of where we are today. And then, uh, time permitting, we'll see how many of these futuristic speculations uh, I can get to. Um, and they're, they're color-coded, so um, the first two uh, um, are, I think, quite plausible, and uh, I think are something, the first one something that we may get some understanding of, even in our generation. Uh, the second one, maybe we get some understanding of, I vacillate in thinking between very optimistically 10 years from now and pessimistically 100 years from now, but certainly before 250 years. Okay. So those are in blue. Uh, and um, and that's, first of all, that we essentially know already that this whole reductionist paradigm that we've been following in particle physics for a long time, that the explanation for a phenomenon at more macroscopic scales is found by going to shorter and shorter distances, which because of quantum mechanics and the uncertainty principle means going to higher and higher energies, 
That whole paradigm is wrong, fundamentally wrong. Okay? Reductionism is fundamentally wrong. And at, eventually, because of gravity and the physics of black holes and other things that I'll talk about, extremely high energy physics becomes equivalent to extremely long distance physics again. And so there is a correlation between the physics of very, of very high energy and very long distances. Uh, this is uh, something that's, that, that's famously referred to all the time uh, in this field as the IRUV connection, the infrared ultraviolet connection. Uh, and, uh, and I think we're going to see more and more of this. We see many hints of it already. We're going to see more and more of it. It's going to turn into a, into a science. We're going to understand what this fusion is between the infrared and the ultraviolet a lot better. Uh, the second is a more radical statement. Uh, um, I think almost uh, most people would agree with the statement one. Uh, the second statement is a little more radical statement. I, I certainly believe it, and I think we have some really concrete evidence for it. That uh, we're going to find that uh, both space-time and quantum mechanics have to be approximate notions, perhaps, as I'll argue. Uh, but the answer is going to end up being that there are some more primitive building blocks out of which space-time and quantum mechanics emerge together, simultaneously. It's not like there is space, there is a space-time classical world and there's a quantum world, uh, and they're sort of being mixed together. Space-time and quantum mechanics are going to be seen as being fundamentally joined at the hip. Uh, and, and are going to emerge simultaneously from more primitive building blocks. So those are the things I'll likely get to. Um, the things in green are, 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 more, uh, are, are, are much more speculative. Um, uh, but if we, if we make it to the end of the blue ones, uh, we'll, have, uh, we'll at least set the stage for talking about something that might come beyond uh, space-time and quantum mechanics. Uh, as we'll see, the essential difficulties have to do with uh, um, uh, having systems that are fundamentally finite. Uh, our, our, no, our normal pictures of quantum mechanics necessitate some infinity somewhere, some infinitely large system somewhere. Uh, but uh, we know, especially in cosmology, we're forced to confront situations which are fundamentally finite. And in those situations, quantum mechanics just cries uncle. It doesn't uh, tell us what, what we're supposed to do. So, so the speculation is that there is some way of dealing with fundamentally finite systems. It's going to go beyond uh, uh, space-time and quantum mechanics, and it's going to have some notion of what I call system observer duality, which will become more clear when we, uh, if, if we get to it. And finally, in the, the wildest uh, speculation of all, but it's very uh, near and dear to my heart, is that when we ultimately have such a theory as the already crazy thing on the third line, uh, we'll understand that the ultimate theory of cosmology will be intimately connected to number theory. Uh, and that's something that, uh, that physicists have wondered for a long time. We've made contact with all sorts of wonderful structures in mathematics over the centuries, but this queen of mathematics is sitting there resisting any structural connection with physics for a long time. I think there's a very good reasons why we haven't made contact with it so far, but that this question about finite quantum systems ultimately is a place where number theory is going to uh, uh, play a crucial role in our understanding of physics. All right, so we'll see how far we get. All right, so, so but first, before uh, going into la-la land, uh, let's start uh, with just a review of uh, where we are and what some of the experimental frontiers are. So of course, you all know about the Large Hadron Collider. That's a highly squashed aerial view of the, of the area outside of Geneva. Of course, you don't see this uh, uh, red oval on the ground from above, but, uh, <laughs> but down there, uh, there's a 27 kilometer round ring. Uh, the collisions are taking place at around uh, an energy roughly 10,000 times uh, the mass of the proton. The velocity of the proton going around the ring are that's seven nines there, 0 0.9999999 times the speed of light. And we're probing distances at around 1,000 times smaller than the nucleus of the atom. And um, my generation of uh, physicists and the generation before mine, we've all been anxiously awaiting uh, uh, really the results of what's going to happen in this run that it's starting up again uh, now in uh, June, um, uh, and is going to tell us the answer to many uh, theoretical mysteries. Um, but as Freeman alluded to earlier, uh, since these machines take 20, 30 years uh, to, uh, to conceive, plan, and build, you have to start thinking about the future now. Uh, and fortunately, um, both in Europe 
at CERN, which is a very natural place uh, to do it. Uh, as well as in China, uh, there is some serious activity in thinking about what the next machine uh, might be. I completely agree with everything Freeman said about, uh, about, um, uh, about the status of these big uh, particle accelerators. It would be absolutely wonderful to have a new uh, breakthrough acceleration mechanisms, and there are many people thinking about it. Um, but this is a step that we can actually take. Uh, this is a step that, that we can take. It's not, it's not insane. In fact, we're basically th thinking about doing this in the United States in, uh, in the 90s when we eventually canceled the superconductor super collider. So it's a little crazy to think 40 years later you can't basically do the same thing with a factor of 200 in the energy. So I'm showing you these little maps just so you see this is a sort of map that warms the heart of a particle physicist, which is a, some map with a picture of rings on the ground. Okay. So, so you see on the left is the area around uh, Geneva. There's the little <coughs> pinky LHC, and there's an 80 to 100 kilometer tunnel that will even pass underneath Lake Geneva. Um, and that can get to maybe around 100 kilometers big, you can get to energies around 8 to 10 times the energy of the LHC. And there's analogous pictures in China, that's 300 kilometers northeast of Beijing, the area called Qinghuan Dao. I'm told it's very beautiful, there's beaches, there's no pollution. Um, uh, that's where the Communist Party officials take their summer vacations. Uh, and that's a little picture of a 50 kilometer ring and a 100 kilometer ring. Um, so, um, in the particular case of the Chinese effort, the Chinese government is deciding this year, in fact, effectively this, this summer, uh, whether they're going to take the first step in this direction and at least fund at the level of you know, a few hundred million dollars a five-year R&D project to see where this thing is actually, uh, uh, to see whether it's feasible and, and, and if it goes forward. But if any one of these two things happen, that's the, essentially the 20 to 40-year future of, of, uh, of the particle physics. Uh, uh, for example, the Chinese would start digging in 2020. Okay, so, um, so, uh, okay. And, um, uh, for example, since we've been on the hunt for supersymmetry for a long time, um, supersymmetry does not have to, as a conceptually, as a theoretical framework, it doesn't have to appear at accessible energies, but if it solves some of the theoretical puzzles that we've been thinking about for a long time, it should show up. It should have even shown up at the LHC. So, um, uh, but if it doesn't show up at the LHC, you might wonder, you're a little unlucky, you just missed it. Uh, the next machine just will blow it out of the water. So you don't have to look in any detail at these plots other than to see green line far out, black line close in. Okay, so uh, that was roughly a factor of five, six, seven uh, increase in reach in mass um, uh, from, uh, from these uh, new machines relative to the LHC. So that's the high energy short distance frontier. <coughs> Let's zoom out in the other direction. Um, we have the cosmic frontier. So, so, uh, and uh, you've all probably seen these beautiful pictures of the cosmic uh, microwave background. Our earliest evidence that there was a uh, that there was a hot big bang, and we later found these tiny little inhomogeneities, one part in a hundred thousand inhomogeneities, differences in temperature between different spots on the sky. And as far as anyone can tell, it looks completely <laughs> random like white noise, Gaussian. Okay. Uh, there are these beautiful plots made by the WMAP satellite and from the data from the WMAP satellite and the Planck collaboration, um, which are, are furthermore consistent with the picture that you have these one part in 100,000 uh, variations that are basically distributed in a scale invariant way uh, across all distance scales um, that, that we can see. Um, and that in turn is exactly what you'd expect from this very simple picture of the early universe uh, known as inflation, where there was uh, this uh, period of tremendous exponential expansion early on in the history of the universe. Now, what can we do with this information? So people uh, have already done lots of measurements on, on this, uh, uh, and they're also looking to see if there's any analogous power in gravitational waves, which would be extremely exciting. Um, uh, but, uh, but there's more that can be done. And in fact, in a very precise sense, uh, the physics of inflation and the physics of these inhomogeneities we see on the sky is very closely parallel to experiments we do at accelerators and at colliders. Uh, at a, uh, before we collide particles, we have to figure out who the stable particles are in the world, and who the things are that are even you can possibly make and bang into each other. Figuring out who the stable particles are is essentially measuring a 
correlation between the particle being here and being there, being there at much, much longer time. So it's what you might think of as a two-point correlation. Okay? So particles that have nice, long-distance two-point correlations, those are the stable guys. Very good. You decided who's stable. But then all of the information, I mean, once you know who they are, all the properties are basically controlled by the fact that the world has this symmetries of translational invariance, Lorentz invariance, and so on. All the dynamical information happens when you collide them into each other and see, see what new things come out. So you learn something about the physics that goes beyond simply the identity of the particles and the symmetries by banging them into each other. And that's what we do with accelerators. The analog of this in inflation is that we've seen the scale invariant spectrum, um, and that's like seeing the particle. Uh, the particle is often called the inflaton. Uh, but all of the, all of the physics uh, um, that isn't just essentially its existence has to do with how it interacts with itself. And that's something that we can look for by looking at deviations from a completely Gaussian pattern on the sky. Now, just like at accelerator, uh, just like at accelerators, uh, you can infer properties of new particles that might be there from features in cross sections. Uh, you see, at some mass, some energy, the cross section gets really big because you're producing a resonance. Okay? Um, by looking at the angular uh, pattern of the decays that come out, you can tell something about whether the particle at spin zero, spin one, spin two. Uh, we can do exactly the same thing uh, with this uh, cosmological collider. Um, so on the left, we have the picture of just the, uh, the, the, the production of these quantum mechanical fluctuations by the accelerating early universe that gets spread out to these enormous distance scales, giving us the uh, little pattern of fluctuations we see. But for instance, there's one interaction it must have. It has to have some interaction with gravity. And so there is an irreducible, completely calculable effect of a, of a uh, of a correlation, a three-point interaction, or a four-point interaction, the, the way I've drawn it, that you should be able to look for and see. And that's, uh, if there's nothing else going on, that's an absolutely minimal thing that just has to be there. But beyond that, if you have some new massive particle, just like we do with accelerators, if you have some new massive particle, uh, it can be produced by this uh, uh, extremely rapidly expanding background. Okay? It can be excited and produced. And you can produce a pair of them, and one of them goes off here and it decays to a pair of particles, and one of them goes off there, and at a different time decays to a pair of particles. And that gives you a pattern of correlations with a very striking oscillatory uh, uh, feature, which really tells you that you've produced the particle, which is uh, sitting there for a long time, and first it decays to one guy, and then it decays to another guy. And uh, the, the time difference between when those uh, uh, decays happen uh, there's an there's an there's a there's a phase oscillation. Uh, so uh, so that's a way by looking at this pattern of non gaussianities that you can actually infer that there was a new mass of particle there. You could infer its mass, and you could even infer something about its spin if you measured uh, angular dependence. So so uh, the information is out there. Okay? The, the the information for probing physics at ultra high energy scales where uh, inflation happened, is in principle out there imprinted in these extremely subtle correlations in the sky. Okay. Um, but how do we see them? Well, this effect is so small that you can actually show that just from all the things that we measured from the cosmic microwave background, even if it's there, uh, it's impossible to pick it out statistically just over the random statistical fluctuations, given that you've only seen a finite number of times this process has, has occurred. Okay? So there's, a, there's what you might call shot noise, or more fancily, cosmic variance, which uh, limits, uh, even in principle, how well you can measure these things. However, um, this is a picture of what we actually know about the universe, and what we've actually seen. Um, ignore everything in blue and black. The little thing that looks like a squashed version of the previous uh, Planck picture is a tiny thin skin that goes back this long, long uh, time ago, just around 100,000 years after the Big Bang, when finally the light from uh, the surface uh, made it to us. Um, all of the information in the previous slide comes from that little teeny tiny skin. Then everything else looks like these two fans coming out of the center there that we've seen from the universe up close right around us is included in the red. And everything else is terra incognita. There is a vast volume of stuff about the universe we don't know anything about. We haven't charted. Okay. 
Um, uh, and even if there isn't any weird thing in there, that's an enormous number, almost a factor of 100 million more uh, <coughs> modes that we have that can tremendously reduce this shot noise or cosmic variance limit uh, uh, that we talked about. Such that if it was possible to get access to all that information, and people, and this is the 20 to 40 year future of, uh, of cosmologies, to try to get as much of this volume's worth of information as we can, then there's plenty, there's plenty of room in order to see the effects of these nonlinear interactions that come from gravity, or perhaps even the presence of very heavy new particles. And in this picture, it's in principle possible to probe some new physics, not all of new physics, but some new physics, at energies that are 10 orders of magnitude higher than anything you can imagine doing on a terrestrial accelerator. Okay. Um, so, so this is, I think, a very exciting future for uh, cosmology uh, on this sort of 20-year time scale. Then there's one more frontier, um, which is uh, uh, looking for things that are incredibly weakly interacting. Um, things that are incredibly weakly interacting are bad, because they're very hard to see, but good because they tell us very interesting information. For example, gravity waves are a classic example of something that's extremely weak, weakly interacting. Uh, but the good thing about it is they fly through the universe totally unimpeded. So they give us a window, a completely different window onto what, uh, a completely different window onto the universe. Um, similarly, we have this uh, background of uh, neutrinos that are left over. Uh, no one has detected them, but that's, uh, that's, it's not crazy that we might uh, uh, detect them, other people are starting to think about them. Uh, uh, there are a slew of other things, um, uh, but what I want to stress is that all these, what all these things have in common is that they're not very high energies, they're not, the, it's not accelerated, it's not looking out on the sky. It's a sort of a precision frontier. Uh, and um, in many of these cases, there were completely new experimental ideas that didn't exist even five or ten years ago, that exploit advances in quantum coherent atomic physics uh, in order to make new inroads on some of these uh, problems. It's not crazy since they involve very high precision, and that's where we're getting some, uh, uh, some uh, uh, leverage. Okay, so that's, uh, that's all I want to say about the experimental frontier. Uh, so now let me move on and uh, uh, summarize what the, um, uh, what the main theoretical challenges are that we face in the 21st century. And as I said, I'll talk more about one of them. Um, the first one, which is that we believe space-time is doomed. It has to be replaced by something else. And um, it's even conceivable that quantum mechanics ultimately uh, has some limitations. Uh, and I don't mean this in a sort of crackpot sense, that the quantum mechanics is wrong in any experiment anyone is going to do anytime soon in their basement of a laboratory somewhere. But I mean that for uh, for subtle cosmological questions, uh, we reach limitations of quantum mechanics. We have situations where quantum mechanics doesn't tell us what to do. Okay. So, so we're in need for some extension of the usual picture. <clears throat> All right, so why is space-time doomed? So let's go through some of the uh, classic arguments. So <clears throat> um, uh, you know that if you want to probe, let's say you want to arbitrarily well probe what's going on in this little region of space-time, uh, because of quantum mechanics and the uncertainty principle, I need higher and higher energies to probe shorter and shorter distances, more and more money from international big governments or booming <laughs> economies, okay? Uh, but eventually I can do it. There's no obstruction to probing arbitrarily short distances. But when you turn on gravity, something bad happens at some point. You put so much energy into such a tiny region of space that you collapse the region that you're looking at into a black hole. Okay? And all your attempts at getting information from there is stymied. Now, let's say you get frustrated, and you build an even bigger accelerator, a more powerful microscope, what happens? Even more mass, you make an even larger black hole. Okay. So at some point, it becomes impossible to even in principle, conceptually, uh, resolve distances and times that become arbitrarily short. It, uh, the scale at which this happens is this famous Planck length. Distance is around 10 to the minus 33 centimeters, times around 10 to the minus 43 seconds. Uh, just to put that into perspective, the scales that we're probing at the Large Hadron Collider are 10 to the minus 17 centimeters. So there are you know, 16 orders of magnitude removed from this. And the fact that this, this scale is so gar gargantuanly smaller, that's a, an illegal thing to say. <laughs> the fact that it's so tremendously smaller uh, is a reflection of how weak gravity is compared to all the other, all the other uh, forces that, that we know about. 
But every time this happened to us in physics before, where there is a concept we can't even in principle assign operational meaning to, it means that that concept is approximate and it has to emerge from something else. But in this case, it's dramatic because the thing that has to emerge from something else is space time. And physics has changed a tremendous amount in 400 years, but one thing has never changed. What it's about, even the purpose of the science, is to describe how things change in time as they move through space. Okay, so so we're so this this cannot be a small move. Okay. Now, this these issues become relevant at order one. For example, as we evolve the universe back in time, eventually the curvatures get higher and higher, and we encounter this singularity near the Big Bang where we don't know what's going on. Our theory just break down there. Something similar happens inside a black hole. Um, uh, so we just don't know. So there are, there are well-defined physical situations where we can do thought experiments where we don't know how to resolve the outcome. Here's another avatar of the same problem, all the same problem, said many different ways. We can, for example, collide uh, electrons uh, against each other, and there is some there's some chance that the collision takes place through the exchange of a graviton. Uh, the, the, the world is quantum mechanical, so that there's only some probability for the electrons to come out at, at any angle, but we can estimate what that probability amplitude is, and uh, it's proportional to Newton's constant, because it has to do with gravity, uh, but just for very simple reasons of dimensional analysis, it grows with energy. You go to higher and higher energy, it grows and grows. One way to think about it is that the gravity uh, cares about mass and, and energy, and so you go to higher and higher energy, the effect of charge that the electron has, gravitational charge, is larger and larger. Now, when the energy is small compared to this gargantuan Planck energy, which is uh, 19 orders of magnitude bigger than the energy of the, the mass of the proton, or 16 orders of magnitude energy than the beam energies of the LHC, this probability is tiny. But you can keep extrapolating when the energy gets comparable to this Planck energy, or even bigger than it, you have nonsense you're getting an amplitude which is bigger than one. That doesn't make any sense, probabilities have to add up to one. You can't have uh, components of it that are bigger than one. So that just tells us that something is breaking down. It's the same story again and again. When you go to extremely short distances, high energies, our description of physics just breaks down. Now, I, I want to use this as a little vignette to uh, illustrate the way uh, progress can be made. Uh, given the very tight theoretical structure with which we are working, uh, to give you um, a story for why string theory is so interesting to a many theoretical physicists, which is perhaps different than the story that, that, that you hear in many uh, popular uh, expositions. Um, so here's a, a first challenge, a very first challenge, if you want to have a theory that, have, that, that, that makes sense of uh, quantum mechanics and gravity, is that it should fix this problem. If I'm colliding gravitons together, it should fix the problem that this probability grows and grows and grows. right? So somehow there's a formula. You don't need to pay attention to the details. But there's a formula, which is the standard formula you get from ordinary gravity. That's what it has to look like at low energies. If you can see, those variables s, t, and u are just a measure of the energy of the particles. Okay? So this is the formula. You can calculate. That's what it looks like at low energies. And you have to fix it. You have to modify it somehow so it doesn't get big. Well, a very natural thing you could try to do is just never let it get anywhere near big. Like, let's say, let's chop it off when it gets to 0.01, okay? Somehow we're going to modify things, so when it hits 0.01, it gets small again, right? It, that, that's at least one zeroth order challenge. Right? There are many other problems, but it's one of them. Okay, well, how do we do that? Well, you might think this is a very easy thing to do, okay? Uh, just take that <coughs> formula and multiply it by some factors that make it small when s, t, and u become <laughs> larger than something. And this is what we do. This is the, a lot of our, as I said, a lot of our time is just spent doing dumb things like that. Okay? So you do it, and normally the dumb things work. Um, in fact, uh, 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 I don't have time to explain this so much, but before the Higgs was discovered, there is a problem similar, mathematically, naively similar to this one, which also involves some amplitude that was growing. And uh, there you could say, hey, let's just stick in some factor, uh, that, make it small, and the dumbest thing you do works. And the solution is called the Higgs particle. Okay? So that's, that's the case where the simplest possible thing actually works. But so you, you try the same thing here. You put some factors and they say, oh, I'm done. But it's more tricky than that. You have to make sure that this thing has to have a consistent interpretation as a probability which means it has some very specific kind of uh, analytic structure in these variables. Um, certain coefficients, when you do the calculation, have to come out to be positive. 
in order for it to have a consistent inter interpretation as, as, as giving you a probability. Well, if you try it with your first few dumb guesses, you find they're negative. You say, oh, I was just too stupid. I'll try another one. We're always negative. Always somebody somewhere is negative. After a little while, you prove a theorem that every way of doing it you can imagine with some simple factors with ST and U upstairs and downstairs will always give you somebody negative. So that's the typical progression in the life of a theorist. You go from thinking something is trivial to thinking that it's impossible. <laughs> <laughs> However, later someone comes up with this some amazing formula. And you don't need to look at it in any detail. I'm just writing these things down just so you see how concrete it is. Okay? There's some formula. Those things are called gamma functions. If you're familiar with them, you are. If they're not, they're some just generalizations of, of, the, of the factorial that makes sense even when numbers aren't integers. And that weirdo combination of gamma functions, absolutely incredibly, when you work it out, all these numbers that have to come out positive come out positive. I say, I, you thought you proved the theorem. Well, there are all these little fine points in your theorem. You assume that there are only finitely many particles you can have. This violates it. There's all sorts of loopholes that it uses. Then you say, ah, great, some, some uh, genius came up with this one. Now I can muck around around it, and I can multiply by this and that, all sorts of other things, and uh, surely they'll all work now that I have this trick. Nope, nothing else works. <laughs> you do it again, you muck around again, now, now nothing else works. So somehow, this is a singular sort of isolated formula. And people came up with this formula almost 50 years ago. And in the intervening 50 years, no one has found another formula. It's a completely concrete exercise. I could even explain it to a high school student. Um, uh, it's a concrete exercise, and no one has come up with another formula. Now, when these miracles happen, we're not content to seriously say it's just a miracle happened. You try to understand where the miracle is coming from. And people eventually realize, staring at this formula, that this formula arose from a picture where particles weren't point particles, but were little loops of string. Okay. That's the direction in which things happen. And, and, uh, and it's a direction in which progress typically happens, not the picture that is cleaned up at the end when we're presenting things, when we say, imagine things are loops, right? If you say that, it sounds like, it sounds dumb. Like, uh, you think they're loops, I think it's something else. I think they're angels or fractals or some other weird shit, right? Why do you like loops? You think it's elegant and pretty. I, I don't give a crap about your elegance and prettiness. That's not what we mean by elegance and prettiness in, in mathematics and physics. What we mean are things that have this incredible rigid structure to them that, are, uh, that, uh, that, that can't be tinkered with without completely collapsing the whole structure. It's hard to come up with them systematically. It takes uh, strange jumps sometimes. Um, but anyway, that's why people are excited about, about string theory. And if you came up with another formula tomorrow, uh, no matter who you are, you would be a you know, superstar overnight. Everyone would be thrilled and would drop everything they're doing and start studying your formula because it happens every 50 years when you find the formula. So uh, that illustrates uh, how progress can happen. As I said, we're not doing any experiments at, the, uh, at these super high energies, but even trying to come up with a candidate that's not wrong, that's not inconsistent with things we know already, is tremendously concerning. All right, but, uh, but it turns out that all of these issues about, all these issues about uh, uh, the very high energy behavior of particle scattering, <clears throat> uh, are not the most central difficulty with putting quantum mechanics and gravity together. Uh, and this is what I want to spend a little bit of time uh, talking about, um, because it, it goes to the very heart of what's uh, so strange and wonderful about, about quantum mechanics. Um, uh, you see that, it's, that there's, a real, there's a real essential conceptual problem. In order to talk about any precise quantity in quantum mechanics, you all know that, that, uh, that in quantum mechanics you're only allowed to calculate, uh, to predict probabilities. And so, in order to, to talk about anything with any precision, you have to imagine that you do the experiment infinitely often. Okay? So there's, there's one infinity that's lurking. You have to do the experiment infinitely often in order to uh, do anything with perfect precision. And that we explain to undergraduates. But there's something else that we don't explain as much. We do, but we don't stress as much. There's another infinity, which is that you have to separate the world into two pieces. You have to separate the world into a system that's being looked at and an infinitely large measuring apparatus okay, in order to talk about anything with perfect precision. Now, why is that? Let's say I, me, okay, I want to measure some, uh, the magnetic moment of the electron to 10 to the, get this, 10 to the 10 to the 40, 10 to the 10 to the 40, 
decimal places. Okay, completely absurd. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, there's a team of graduate students and food, and, 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 and they just come in one at a time and put one decimal point, another one, another one, another one, I'm inexhaustible, right? Immortal is what. Uh, but it's pointless because at around the 10 to the 10 to the 30th decimal place, because I'm made of 10 to the 30 things, I, as a quantum mechanical system, I can fluctuate into a cloud of dust. Okay. Uh, one of the less bad things that could happen is there could be a little fluctuation in my brain. And even though I was supposed to put down seven in the 10 to the 10 to 30 decimal place, I put two. Okay. <laughs> Finite systems have an intrinsic, irreducible, uh, systematic uncertainty because of quantum mechanics. To any, so there's nothing that you can talk about with perfect precision. Now, why don't we talk about this as much? Because it's practically absurdly irrelevant. Okay. The first one where you do the experiment and time, that's called statistical error. If you do the experiment n times, it goes like one over square root of n. Pretty crappy, so we have to make n really big. The second one goes like e to the minus n, if you were made out of n things. So it's practically utterly irrelevant. However, it has a very important conceptual importance, just like you know, the position and velocity of a baseball are perfectly decent ideas to a baseball player, but the fact that in quantum mechanics we can't use the word and, but we have to use or when we talk about position uh, or velocity, uh, similar, and that has very profound conceptual importance. There's something analogous here when we turn on gravity once again. And now this doesn't involve doing anything at extremely high energies or anything like that. Let's say I want to measure any quantity in a room, in a fixed size room. The fancy word for this is a local observable, but it's what it sounds like. It's something I'm, I'm you know, an experiment I'm doing in a fixed region of space and time. Then I'm obstructed from making this second infinity. I can't make the apparatus uh, made out of infinitely many components because it inevitably gets heavier and heavier. And before it becomes infinitely large, it becomes so heavy that it collapses the whole room into a black hole. Okay? And then you're sucked into the singularity of this very unhappy story. Uh, in particular, you can't do the experiment infinitely often. Okay. So, uh, so, so, so this is a very profound and fundamental point. There's no local observables once you have gravity and quantum mechanics together. Quantum mechanics asks you to divide the world into two pieces, a huge piece, an infinite piece, and a little piece. Gravity doesn't like these artificial distinctions. It's universal. It doesn't like these strange artificial distinctions between different parts of the world. And so the compromise is that there are no local observables. So we've been on this interesting trajectory in the last hundred years. In physics, we seem to have fewer and fewer things we can talk about. We discovered quantum mechanics, so the world wasn't classical, wasn't deterministic. Okay, fine. Now we get the predict probabilities ourselves. Like, in, in principle, fundamentally, zillions of things we can talk about. Now we turn on gravity, we have even fewer things that we are allowed to talk about. Okay? Measurements in a fixed size room, those can't be elements that are there in a fundamental quantum mechanical theory of the world. They're not, uh, they're not perfectly precise. They're all fundamentally fuzzy approximate things. What are the perfectly precise things that we can do? All we can do is retreat and do experiments that start at infinity. We send in particles, they bang into each other, they go back out to infinity. And when we do that, we can prepare them, make them, and observe them with infinitely large detectors. So that's a, that's a remarkable thing that the only observations that you can make with perfect precision in a theory that have gravity don't live in the interior of space and time. They have to live on the walls at infinity of space and time. So this is related to this uh, famous principle of holography, that somehow the interior of the universe is like a hologram of something that fundamentally lives on the walls. And that idea has been instantiated beautifully in string theory over the last uh, 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 18 years or so. Um, and we have a working example of, of, of what can happen. Uh, we have a working example in space times that don't look like ours, don't look like their cosmological space time in detail, uh, that they don't look like cosmological space time at all. Uh, but, uh, but as far as uh, uh, they, 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 their space times that look like the inside of a little tin can. Um, imagine that that little uh, cylinder is like a tin can. The geometry inside is curved, and it's curved in this peculiar way such that light from the center, the, the, the distance from the center out to the walls is, is infinite, but light takes a finite amount of time uh, to get to the walls and bounce back. So it's really like putting gravity in a box. Um, but gravity in that box, uh, uh, from the, the, the curvature could be 100 billion light years. 
Okay, so if you're living on the inside, you have no idea the box is there. The, you, you, know, you, you wouldn't know anything about that. So if we didn't know about the cosmology of our universe, uh, for all we knew, we could be in a box like this. We know we're not, but it doesn't make any difference for small-scale experiments. Nonetheless, the logic that I told you before would tell you that the only observables that you can talk about, start and end, are sort of pinging things on, on, on the walls of the box and measuring correlations between these pingings on the walls of the box. And if that's where the experiments start and end, and that's where the observations are, are made, it's less crazy that there might actually be a theory that only lives on the walls of the box, that, that, that does the computation in a completely different way, where there's no interior fundamentally. There's just the things out on, on the walls. And the interior is like a hologram, is, uh, is one representation of the answer to this problem of, uh, of what happens when, when, you, uh, when you hit things on the outside. Uh, now, one of the remarkable things, so there are the com com complete, many by now, concrete working examples of this. Uh, one of the remarkable things about it is that the theory that lives on the walls of the box doesn't have any gravity in it. It's a theory that's a pretty close cousin of the ordinary theories of quarks and gluons. Uh, of course, it differs from quarks and gluons, because ultimately, in very high-energy experiments, when we look inside the proton, we see individual quarks and gluons. But here, the interactions between these quarks and gluons are so strong that you lose track of their individuality. They're constantly turning in, into each other. And the effective description of all of that strong dynamics is, in fact, exactly the same as if you generate uh, uh, out of these particles with no gravity, no extra dimensions, no strings, um, you generate all of these things on the inside. Uh, emergent space, gravity, strings, and so on. So this is wonderful. Um, and it's a first working example of what this idea of emergent space-time might look like, uh, except for a very important if, a, a very important but. And it's probably the only reason this could be this this could have been discovered in a straightforward way by human beings, is that we didn't have to go all the way. I, I like to call this the gateway drug to the idea of emergent space-time. Okay, like any gateway drug, it's not so bad. You don't have to give up everything. But, you know, you are, but it kept you in. Uh, it tempts you in, in perhaps uh, uh, nefarious directions. So here, this is not so bad. It's not such a it's not such a crazy equivalence between because the time that flows on the walls of the box is exactly the same as the time that flows on the inside. Time is not emerged out of anything. Time is sitting there, sacrosanct, just as it always was. And that's why I can't apply to our world because our world hasn't existed forever in the static box. It would be very depressing if this is our world, because we'd have no understanding for where anything came from. All of the business about initial conditions, uh, uh, you know, all that would just be put in uh, by hand by some er god on the outside of the system that dictated uh, how things worked in the beginning. But that's not what seems to be the case in our universe. We have a cosmology. Uh, if we go back early in time, we have this Big Bang singularity. Uh, um, we don't know what happens there. And even more, Disturbingly, and I'll come back to this in a bit, in the late universe, uh, we discovered in the late 1990s that the universe is accelerating. Uh, in this accelerating universe, uh, the constant acceleration means that everything we see out there in the universe now is everything we're ever going to see. Uh, there are regions uh, far away that if, if the universe wasn't accelerating, light from them would eventually reach us. But now it won't. The universe is doubling in size at a constant rate, so light from them will never make it to us. And that means that for the first time, we're in this very strange situation where fundamental finiteness has entered our, our description of physics. Uh, what we have, it's an enormous number of degrees of freedom, but it's fundamentally finite. And that means that everything in this universe, in our accelerating universe, everything is approximate. We don't know any way of talking about anything with, in principle, perfect precision. This is the first time where uh, what quantum mechanics needs in order for us to be able to uh, uh, talk about things sensibly seems to be violated. And that's the first hint that cosmology is calling out for some extension uh, of a quantum mechanics. So obviously, to ultimately understand this, we need to understand not just emergent space, but time is very important. And perhaps we need an extension to quantum mechanics as well. OK. So, um, I've spent most of my time laying out what the uh, issues are, but uh, um, if I can uh, uh, maybe take uh, uh, 10 minutes, I want to get to some of the futuristic speculations. I'll probably have to skip the, uh, the really wild ones uh, at the end. So anyone who wants to hear some really crazy stories, we can uh, talk a little afterwards. All right, 
So, but I want to talk about the uh, two of them, which I think are are, are rather are rather paradox. Um, first is this idea that uh, that we essentially know already that the, that the reductionist paradigm isn't right and it has to be replaced by something else. Um, something else is probably going to involve some some much tighter fusion between the physics of very high energies and physics of very long distances. So um, here are a few. Uh, of classic avatars of this. I mentioned one of them already. When we collide particles at incredibly high energies, we make bigger and bigger black holes. Okay, so higher energies correspond to longer distances. Uh, there are other uh, famous examples of the presence of gravity giving you a qualitatively different answer to very basic things that you think you can measure at, at long distances, very low energy. Someone gives you a big box, and you ask, in principle, how many degrees of freedom could you have in the box? Maybe you have a little spin, you know, you have a bunch of spins on different sites. Each spin can be up or down. How many degrees of freedom could you have? You could have two to the n degrees of freedom, right? Uh, and it would scale like the volume of the box. So you would think that the number of all possible total degrees of freedom scales exponentially with the volume of the box. But once again, if you try to excite too many of those degrees of freedom at the same time, they have a huge amount of energy that collapses the whole box into a black hole. And in fact, we know that the maximum possible number of degrees of freedom that you can uh, have in the box scales like the area, uh, exponential in the area, area over G Newton, and not the volume. Okay? So, so these are things that have been appreciated uh, for a long time. Um, but uh, uh, and see, somehow, the, the fact that we know something ahead of time about what's going on at ultra high energies, without gravity, we don't know what's going on at ultra high energies. And so, so you would think there is some fundamental theory that lives at arbitrarily short distances. It has some rules. Uh, in order to figure out what they are, we just have to get up there. <clears throat> and meanwhile, if we're at low energies, uh, there has to be some consistency just for the low energy particles all by themselves, but they sort of decouple from each other. There are some set of consistency conditions just on low energy physics. Those are the ones that I talked about in the beginning of the talk that these theorists in the locked in the room could figure out by themselves. And then whatever's going on at very high energies just has to wait until you get there. But gravity is different, because we know something ahead of time about very, very high energy things. Very, very high energy things come back and infect very long distances again. So it could be that, uh, uh, it could be that, the, that, that there are some completely new sorts of consistency requirements um, uh, that enforce funny properties of low energy physics that um, look very look strange from the point of view of a low energy physicist, but are guaranteed by the presence of uh, gravity and black holes. I'll give you one example. There are many, many examples. I'll give you one example just because it's so simple um, and, and familiar. One of the most familiar facts of everyday life is that, as we just said, gravity is incredibly weak. So the gravitational attraction between uh, two electrons is 42 orders of magnitude uh, weaker than the electric repulsion between. But in your mind as a theoretical physicist, you could just make the electric charge of the electron smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. What could go wrong? You're just making it smaller, 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 smaller. <coughs> you could, in your head, make the charge arbitrarily tiny. You could make it 10 to the minus 50. <clears throat> and there seems to be nothing wrong from the point of view of the consistency of long distance physics for making that happen. But of course, something funny happens along the way. At some point, gravity becomes stronger than electromagnetism. And there seems to be deep reasons why that cannot happen. Gravity must always remain to be the weakest force of all. And so every time you try to realize in some, in some consistent theoretical framework, making some coupling like the electric charge arbitrarily small, something should block you. This seems to be true in many, many examples that, uh, that, that, that people have explored theoretically. And it, it, and it predicts a sort of a, a, a rich spectrum of constraints now. If we imagine we have uh, very short distance physics that very slightly corrects Einstein's equations in some way, these corrections need to make sure they respect this property. So there have to be some very specific sets of signs that come in for these uh, higher order corrections. And every time people have looked at whether the signs come out right, they always come out right. These are things that are surprising from the point of view of a low energy physicist, but they reflect somehow this deep consistency of very high energies with very long distances. I believe that there's a ton of things like this out there, and we're just barely starting to come to a grips with them. Um, 
but uh, but but that uh, Feynman was going to tell us something important about the structure of low energy physics beyond what we know. <coughs> Another aspect of this is that uh, I, I I told you before that when we tried to make sense of gravity at very high energies, uh, we tried these dumb things and they all <laughs> failed. Um, if you probe a little deeper, why they fail? Why did they work in the case of the Higgs particle? And why do they not work in the case of gravity? The root of the problem is that all the interactions involving the Higgs are short range. That's why we didn't see these particles until the 20th century. Um, gravity is long range. And the heart of the issue for why it's impossible to do the same thing you do for gravity as we did so easily in other situations is the long range feature is the fact that gravity is a long range force. So again, what's obstructing fixing up the theory in, in the ultraviolet is the fact that it gives you a long range force in the infrared. Very concrete, well defined problem. And in fact, I mentioned it before, but I think there is a completely sharp, well posed mathematical question of what are the functions that make this happen? Uh, and you might, you might be able to prove that that function with the ratio of gamma functions is unique and nothing else does. Or you might find another one. But it's, uh, it's not a question of aesthetics or philosophy or belief. It's a well-posed, perhaps very difficult, but well-posed mathematical question. <clears throat> Finally, uh, uh, there is obvious uh, UVIR connections to think about in uh, cosmology. <clears throat> if we go back to the experiment where we imagine colliding particles making bigger and bigger black holes, in a universe that's accelerating, we can't make that black hole arbitrarily big. The biggest it can be is roughly the size of the universe. So again, uh, incredibly high energy physics is now telling us about uh, cosmological physics. Okay. So that's, uh, and uh, there must be some, some consistency there that we don't know about. Uh, there is another obvious set of questions. When you have an expanding universe, um, you know, it's not like, and, and nothing in this business of quantum mechanics and gravity will end up looking like you have some little discrete structure in space, like, like, the, like there are little atoms of space and time or a lattice or something like that. Uh, that runs afoul of relativity. It has all sorts of uh, difficulties. But one difficulty is what happens in an expanding universe? Did you expand it all? These atoms get bigger and bigger and bigger. That would be a gross contradiction with experiment. So what must happen as the universe expands is somehow new degrees of freedom are born. Where are they coming from? Where were they ahead of time? Why didn't we know about them? They were somewhere deep, 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 deep in the ultraviolet, and they somehow turn into deep, 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 deep uh, in the infrared at incredibly long, long distances. <clears throat> Finally, another aspect of this connection, and it's, it's really amusing if you think uh, from a bird's eye perspective what the uh, history of the universe looks like. We likely started with something like a Big Bang. There was probably something like a period of inflation, just accelerated in expansion. Then there was some intermediate period. And now we're accelerating again. And I didn't have time to explain it, but the very, very likely end state of our universe is to go back into a big crunch. Okay. So it's extremely symmetrical looking. Okay. Uh, we start with uh, some singularity, accelerate, some intermediate period, accelerate, and another singularity again. Why is there this uh, symmetry between the deep past very early and very late? Uh, so, uh, so this connection is something I think uh, it's being studied from many different uh, angles. It's very well appreciated in the field, and I suspect there will be lots of progress on it uh, in, the, uh, in the coming years. So let me move on to the second one before I end. And this is the one which is uh, a, a little bit more radical. Uh, and that's the idea that space, time, and quantum mechanics will end up emerging hand in hand for more primitive ideas. Um, now, there's one aspect of this that we've alluded to already. We've seen already how space can emerge from more primitive ingredients. And something that's caused a lot of excitement over the past uh, couple of years is, so we've known from this holographic equivalence that the quantum mechanical interactions of quarks and gluons can produce things that look like space and gravity. But something that's being appreciated more and more is that, it, it, is that the intrinsically quantum phenomenon of entanglement uh, can play a central role in the creation of geometry on the other side. It's not just completely garden variety quantum mechanical phenomenon, but the intrinsically new quantum mechanical phenomenon that plays a role in the creation of the uh, geometry. Um, <clears throat> uh, there are various versions of this, which I don't have time to uh, discuss in more detail, um, but 
Uh, but that's all still within the well understood, in principle, at least well defined theoretical framework of uh, having a theory of quarks and gluons, strongly interacting quarks and gluons, turn into a theory of, of gravity. But what about time? That's, uh, that's, that's what I alluded to as the biggest, as the biggest conceptual challenge. That's a much taller order. It's very hard to know how to systematically work on this question of how we understand how time itself can emerge out of more primitive building blocks. Um, I, 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 I like to say, that, I mean, it's important to know what the very big questions are, but instead of the beginning, you have to know what to do with your time. Um, you want to wake up in the morning, and you can't just wake up in the morning and say, today I will work on emergent time. Okay, you can go to your office, you can sit down, then what, right? Uh, so you have to have something concrete in mind. Um, and people are working on this from a variety of different angles, but one of them that, that uh, I've, I've been uh, particularly uh, interested in myself um, takes some inspiration from the fact that sometimes uh, big clues aren't, uh, are hiding in rather mundane places. They're actually hiding in plain sight as funny features of the existing standard theoretical framework. So let's just take a step back from all this highfalutin uh, nonsense. Uh, and go back to thinking about the LHC. Okay? So, um, <clears throat> uh, in order to uh, prepare to discover these exciting new particles at the LHC, uh, we collide all these protons together, stuff comes out, and here's a cartoon, experimentalists here will kill me for simplifying what they do so much with this uh, plot. Um, but this is sort of a cartoon, is that in order to look for uh, new physics, you're looking for a minuscule bump, tiny, tiny, uh, amount of new stuff compared to an enormous rate of, compl of completely ordinary processes. So, just to give you a, a rough cartoon, there's maybe a billion collisions a second, um, but if we're lucky, uh, we're going to discover supersymmetry in this run. Maybe we'll make one every minute, okay, one every hour. Uh, so, the rates are tremendously different. Uh, and so, you have to understand in extreme detail what the predictions are for ordinary for the ordinary processes, right? So now, this on the face of it doesn't sound like the sexy part of the problem. The sexy part is all that new stuff, and somebody has got to go do the hard work of figuring out what the boring standard uh, physics is, right? Um, but physics has a way of rewarding morally good behavior. <laughs> um, and uh, well, this is what happens when you start uh, trying to do this. Uh, Feynman and Freeman, uh, uh, in equal parts, tell us what to do. Um, we know the rules. And you open up a textbook, and if we want to know the rate for two of these gluons and the protons coming in, and four of them going out, which is something that we need to know, if it's two to two, you put it on problem sets. If it's two to four, um, or two to three, two to four, you start working it out. Then things start looking difficult. Okay? There's 220 diagrams, tens of thousands of terms, and it looks complicated. Now. Um, uh, not everything in life has a simple answer. And part of the chauvinism of a certain part of uh, physics is to declare as interesting only those questions that have simple answers. <laughs> okay? And everything else is just a messy gunk. But someone had to do this gunk, right? Because we needed it for, for practical reasons. <clears throat> and this is what you get. You get, like, uh, actually, this is just two to three. For two to four, there'd be maybe 80 pages of expressions that look like that. You just open up the textbooks. But in the end, what people found um, is that by, in, originally by hook or by crook, by lots of interesting techniques, they found that the final answer of these 100 pages of algebra was a single term. You don't need to know what these symbols mean, you just need to know they're not defined to be the sum of 100 terms, 100 pages. Okay? Um, so, now, this was not immediately thought of as a tip of an enormous iceberg, but today we know it's a tip of an enormous iceberg. Um, and it makes it obvious that the standard way of doing physics is making something obvious. It's making the usual rules of quantum mechanics and relativity obvious. That's what it's designed to do. Okay? The usual rules of quantum mechanics and space-time as manifest as possible. But it's obviously hiding something else. By doing that, it's hiding some extraordinary new structures. And we should try to figure them out. Now, <clears throat> these two rules of the space-time and quantum mechanics more technically, their locality and unitarity, Unitarity tells you the prob that you have probability am amplitudes and the probability that add up to one. <laughs> Locality tells you the interactions take place at points in space-time. And one of the interesting things <clears throat> uh, uh, you learn after you start studying these uh, scattering amplitudes is that 
let's say you wanted to check if someone did the answer, if someone did the calculation right. They just handed you the final answer. Do you have to go back through and repeat every step of the calculation? No. There's a feature of the final answer that sharply reflects the underlying locality and unitarity of the theory. If someone hands you these mathematical functions, you have to check that they, they blow up in certain places, prescribed places. And the neighborhood of where they blow up, they blow up in a particular way. Okay? So technically, the singularities of these amplitudes contain all the information you need to know in order to see if it's local and unitary. So that's how you can check ahead of time. So that's already interesting. <clears throat> but pushing this point of view <clears throat> in an extreme direction, uh, you can start wondering, since these are simple rules you can check, could it be that there is some <coughs> structure that's actually generating those rules from somewhere else? In other words, there's something which is producing exactly the same results, but never making any reference to evolution in space and time. Never make any reference uh, to the usual quantum mechanical picture uh, of, of states evolving in, in Hilbert space. <clears throat> and this has been an, an activity that's, that's uh, gaining steam over the past 10, 15, 20 years or so, um, especially over the past five, 10 years, uh, a, a really remarkable range of ideas from string theory, from parts of condensed matter physics involving uh, intricate spin change, the ugly duckling of theoretical physics for a long time, Penrose's twister theory, uh, and also beautiful new structures in mathematics that in some cases were just discovered by the mathematicians themselves relatively recently, accidentally. Uh, all these things are coming together and pointing at some new formulation of completely standard physics. We're not talking about fancy things with gravity and cosmology <coughs> and things like that. Completely standard physics where space-time and quantum mechanics are not the stars of the show. Other principles are the stars of the show, and space-time and quantum mechanics are derived properties. Now, why is this good? Because if you believe that they're not really there fundamentally, there must be some way of thinking about even standard physics <coughs> that doesn't make any direct reference to them. And so that's a way that you can be kept on the straight and narrow. That's something you can do when you get up in the morning. You can try to figure out how to reformulate the physics you have under your feet, eviscerating these ideas that eventually you think you might want to have to modify somehow, and seeing how far you can get doing that. <clears throat> and <clears throat> just to give one example, uh, th th this is not, a, 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 I mean, it, it works in detail for, it works in detail for a, uh, in, in complete detail for a toy theory that's not the real world. But this toy theory matches the real world uh, at the very leading order in the strength of the interaction. So it's actually practical. Um, and uh, if we want to calculate the scattering process for these eight gluons at the LHC, let's say two go in, six go out, uh, then you can either write down 500 pages of Feynman diagrams, or you draw this picture in an auxiliary space. I'm not telling you the rules, but this is not space-time. It lives in some completely different space. Someone gives you the external momenta, you draw this picture. The volume of this picture calculates the amplitude. Now, what's interesting about this, and there are many, many other, this is, this is one angle on the problem. There are many related angles, other angles even. Uh, but what's interesting about it is there's evidently no space-time, no Lagrangians, no Hilbert space. Um, there's these other mathematical structures. But we see very explicitly how locality and unitarity are first tied at the hip. They cannot emerge separately. They have to come out together. They're a simultaneous feature of the geometry of this shape. And in fact, it has nothing to do with the detailed angles or none of that. The locality and unitarity is a completely combinatorial property of the geometry of this shape. And so that's, I think, encouraging. Uh, to the idea that, that, that indeed we are going to see um, uh, space time and uh, quantum mechanics uh, emerge more generally uh, joined at the hip. Uh, this way. I'll just mention two other uh, things uh, very quickly before ending. There are many other threads of this general type that suggest that space time and quantum mechanics are secretly uh, much more closely related to each other behind the scenes. One of them sounds a little, uh, sounds a little technical. It's a fascinating thing to anyone who studies the quantum field theory in any detail, that you start off combining relativity and quantum mechanics. Time has a very important role to play. But every time you try to more concretely formulate what this object is, what quantum field theory is, you find that having space and time is a little inconvenient. There's a better description of the physics with no time. 
So, so purely Euclidean. So instead of three dimensions of space and one of time, you just have four of space and no of time. There it's much easier to think about. Oh, it's very clean, it's very well defined. And you get to space and time by some mathematical continuation. That's a very <coughs> old observation. These newer ideas that I was talking about suggest a, a, a different picture, uh, where you don't start with four dimensions of space and two of time, but you start with something that's much more relativistic, a theory with two dimensions of space and two dimensions of time, where time and space are treated on a completely symmetrical footing. Once again, in order to get the usual physics that we want, we have to make a certain uh, continuation. But in both cases, in both cases, the fact that you get something causal and something with a probabilistic interpretation happens simultaneously. They both happen together. So that's uh, that's uh, that's yet another thing which uh, suggests that space-time and quantum mechanics are tied with the hip behind the scenes. And then there's a very qualitative thing that I'll end with. <clears throat> uh, the reason for this tension between space-time and, and quantum mechanics, what goes into uh, <coughs> all of this um, marvelous constrained structure of quantum field theory, is that at the most basic level, uh, space, uh, the picture of space-time tells you that time isn't particularly special, uh, that what one observer can call, calls time and another observer can, can call some combination of space and time. While quantum mechanics changes everything but cares about time a lot. You're supposed to specify what's happening in the system now and involve it later. So on the face of it, they, they, they don't speak the same language. And that's why we have to do so much work to, uh, uh, to describe them consistently together. And yet, over and over again, we find that they buttress each other. In a world without quantum mechanics, uh, the notion of Lorentz invariance is much, more, is much less robust and rigid as it is in a world with quantum mechanics. In a world without quantum mechanics, you might imagine that Lorentz invariance is a completely accidental symmetry that the underlying theory could look like some crazy discrete lattice or something like that, and then at sufficiently long distances you don't see this granular structure and things can look Lorentz invariant. That's totally reasonable in a world without quantum mechanics. But when you turn on quantum mechanics, quantum fluctuations make it impossible for you to forget, even at very long distances, that you broke uh, Lorentz invariance at short distances. So quantum mechanics supports space-time, makes it more rigid. On the other hand, in a world without relativity, you could trivially build these hidden variable models for quantum mechanics and mock it up. It's ugly, but you can mock up the predictions of quantum mechanics in a way which just has uh, uh, hidden variables. It's the locality that's enforced by relativity that makes that impossible. So this is another uh, thing that, while on the surface they seem to be fighting, behind the scenes they are they uh, have a lot in common. So, so, um, so that's the. Uh, uh, that's the punchline. I don't have time to tell you about the other things. Um, uh, oh, unfortunately, well, uh, I'm sorry, Mark and Nancy. Uh, uh, but let me just end by saying back to Earth. So that, that, was the, um, uh, that was the maybe 50, 20, 30, 40, 50 year time scale, maybe longer for the, for the, for the last set of uh, ideas. But I just wanted to uh, remind you what's on our plate for the next 10 years. Um, it's an absolutely critical era for the LHC, uh, for cosmology, and dark matter experiments. This is a period that we've all been waiting for for 20 years. It's happening now, and we're going to get some answers uh, uh, to the questions one, one way or the other soon. And then it's not going to sort of con be a continual, uh, you know, then there's going to be another wait, and we'll have another set of experiments another decade or two after that. But this is a real uh, important period of experiment. I didn't talk about it at all, um, uh, uh, but it, it's not something I'm working on. Um, I'm not an expert in but I think it's very exciting uh, that there's an opportunity to think about a complete new sorts of experiments for probing fundamental physics that are made possible by remarkable new technologies in atomic and condensed matter physics. Um, and from a purely theoretical point of view, we can and should continue to explore this marvelous theoretical structure that's our feet and keep asking this question, what is quantum field theory really until we get a good answer. Thank you very much.